God bless you guys at all of our camps. You can have a seat. Well, listen, I'm here today to talk about um, extending the conversation that Pastor CJ and Kristen started last week in the series entitled, As For Me In My House. And if you weren't here, the conversation is that God raised up a general, God raised up a leader, his name was Joshua, and he put Joshua in the position to lead God's people out of the wilderness into the promised land. And the way they were able to get there is because Joshua had a mentality that as for me and my house, we're gonna serve God. I can't speak for anybody else. I can't speak for my neighbors. I can't speak for my culture. I can't speak for my community. But as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. And I say it in my church, we say it this way, if you want God's best, you have to do it God's way. And that is a reflection of this conversation. And so I wanna continue the conversation by talking about how to raise good and godly kids. What's it look like as for you and your house to raise kids up With this mindset, if I want God's best for my kids, I have to do it God's way. Now, real quick before I jump in, as a communicator, I love to make sure that I put a net around the entire um, community and culture that I'm talking to. Now, that's difficult when you talk about parenting because, first of all, I recognize that in a church this large at all of our campuses, there are probably many parents that have tried to get pregnant and have not been able to. And we're just praying grace and strength and peace on you as your season of struggle and believing miracles for you. But probably most of us are somewhere in that journey. You either want to have kids, you have kids, you have kids and they're grown up, you have, uh, you have blended families, you married into kids, you adopted kids, you've opened up your home to foster kids, or you are in this other phase, the grandparent phase. And so I would say this, most of you probably fit that category. I know there's some of you that you're, you're like a curmudgeon. You don't want kids by you. You don't like kids. You don't even want them in the neighborhood. But I want you to know, listen, anytime you crack God's word, he will communicate to you right where you are in the season of life you're in. So don't tune me out. Lean in and let God speak to you. Amen? So help me to gauge the room at all of our camps. I'd love for you to make some noise. If you're here and you have little kids in the home, make some noise. Okay. Uh, What about teenagers? Did you hear the change? When we have kids that we're showing our pictures, look what God gave me. And when they get to be teenagers, we're like, thanks for bringing that up. (laughs) I'm convinced that teenagers are God's revenge on mankind. God's like, let's see how you like it when you create something in your image and they deny your existence. (laughs) So as we get into this conversation, again, it's a big conversation. It's somewhere we're going to go. But let me ask this question. As parents, and sometimes I don't think we live this way as intentionally as we should, But here's a question I want to ask you, is what is the goal, what is the goal of parenting? What is the goal of parenting? I think all of us should have a goal, and maybe you've never actually said this or thought this, but sometimes I think we find ourselves living with this goal that um, we want to raise perfect kids. I mean, we parent that way, that we put pressure on them to bring straight A's home. We, We put pressure on them to excel and exceed and dance and on the ball field. We expect them to be perfect all the time, doing their chores and being obedient. And so intentionally, we put this pressure on them to parent. Our parenting is to have perfect kids. And I just want you to know that it is impossible to take imperfect parents raising imperfect kids and have perfect kids come up as a result. So you need to wipe that goal off. Another goal that I find oftentimes as parents as we have is oftentimes we make our goal to have successful kids. Well, here's a question. What does it mean to be successful? Success changes from generation to generation, from people to people. What you consider success may not be success next door. What you think is success may not be success in the eyes of your kids. So I'm not really sure success is the best goal. I think the best goal, if you're taking notes, is your goal is to prepare your child for their adulthood. That as you navigate, which means it's going to take you being intentional, purposeful, proactive to do this. And your goal is, again, not to focus on today, but your goal as a parent is to focus on the long game as you interact and as you involve yourself in the life of your kids intentionally. Your goal is to make sure that they are successful adults. And this is, not my, this is not my idea. This comes right from Scripture. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, if you have it, if not, it's on the jumbotron. I would love us to read this out loud at all of our campuses. Come on, every voice, read this. Direct your children onto the... Now, when I stop, you shout. So I'm going to stop. Direct your children onto the... Right path. And when they're older, they will not... So this is God's principle. And this, I want you to lean into this. He says this. He says, direct your children... Now, we live in a generation, and kind of generations, you know it, if you've been here for a little while on planet Earth, you see that trends come and go, and culture comes and goes. There is a new culture in parenting, and it's this idea that I'm going to let my kids decide. 
I'm gonna let my kids decide if they do their homework. I'm gonna let my kids decide when they go to bed. I'm gonna let my kids decide where they sleep. I'm gonna let my kids decide what they eat. I'm gonna let my kids decide if they go to church. I'm not gonna force my religion on them. I'm gonna let them decide. That is not what scripture calls us to do. He doesn't say let kids direct their path. It says you direct their path. And it says direct them onto the, oh, come on, y'all gotta help me here. Direct them onto the right path. If there's a right path, that means there has to be at least one Wrong path. There's lots of wrong paths. Our job is to direct them on to the right path. And then here's the promise. If you'll intentionally involve yourself in directing your children onto the right path, when they get older, they'll not leave it. Which means your kids are gonna leave the path a lot. When they're terrible twos and they're going through rebellious teens, you're gonna find your kids and you're gonna question, you're gonna wonder, am I doing a good job? And you're gonna continually question, are they on the path? God's promise isn't they will always appear to be on the path as children, but if you'll consistently engage and encourage them and set an example before them, when they get old, they'll not depart from it. Now, there's a lot of minor parenting that are really going against this policy and this procedure and this way of parenting because we struggle with sometimes wrestling and going for the long-term goal. We often find ourselves parenting for the short-term success. We want it easy. We want it comfortable. We don't want our kids experiencing too much stress. But sometimes your kids need to experience difficulty and challenges and pushback and tension and pressure because that's the thing that they're gonna experience as adults. So we have to set them up now for success, which means this, if you only parent for the present, our kids will miss the path. So as we get into this day, I wanna give you just a couple real quick disclaimers. Number one, this is a no guilt day. There are no perfect parents at the Carmel campus, no perfect parents at any campus out there. So if you hear anything I say today, my goal is not to make you feel guilty. My goal today is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the power of his grace is to help you look at your life and say, where can I just be better? Anybody here wanna be better? I just wanna be better. So I wanna help you be better and just to look at it without guilt, but just determine I'm gonna apply some of these principles and we're gonna move better to get my kid on the right path. And number two, no comparison. Stop looking at what's happening next door. Your job is not to raise your neighbor's kids, not to raise the Walmart kids you wanna be. Can I say that here? <laughs> Just worry about what's happening in your house. Your kids are different from other kids. You're different parents from other parents. Focus on your kids. So no guilt, no comparison. What I wanna do today is I wanna give you four things. This is a lot of content. We're gonna go really quick and I recognize I talk fast. So you might have to listen to this again. But as we lean into this conversation, I wanna look at a guy in the Old Testament by the name of Eli. Now, if you don't know Eli's story, Eli was the high priest in the temple in the Old Testament. He was technically the CEO. He was really probably more accurately the COO of the temple. It was his job to make sure the HR policies were in place. It was his job to make sure that there were other temple priests that were serving in the temple. It was his job to make sure that the quality of sacrifices met the standard of the Old Testament law that God would receive on behalf of the nation of Israel. And so what you find in the story that we're gonna lean into is you find a, a busy person and also is a struggling parent, which I think you'll find is probably the story of most of you. We live in an incredibly busy world. How can you find yourself in the way of still being a successful parent? So check this out. Four things I wanna give you that I want you to filter. Number one, if you're gonna get your kids and keep them on the right path, number one, you have to build relationally. Everybody say that, you have to build relationally. First Samuel chapter one is where we're introduced to this guy, Eli, and his kids. And listen to what it says. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. And first Samuel, the next chapter, tells us this little piece of information about his kids. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels who had no respect for the Lord or for their duties as priests. So again, the, the reason I lean into this conversation is, again, is, is we find a busy parent raising bad kids. Now I know your kids aren't bad. We're talking about other kids. See, some of you are like, my kids aren't bad. My kids are special. They're special. <laughs> I just want you to know this. Every kid is bad. Every kid goes through the scoundrel stage. The only difference from kid to kid is duration and intensity. Sometimes kids are longer in that season of being a scoundrel, and sometimes they're worse. Your job is to figure out where your kid is at in the scoundrel stage and adjust your parenting accordingly. Come on. And so I have found that oftentimes we're picking the wrong way to parent our kids. Now, again, this is no shame. I find that parenting doesn't come natural. You have to be intentional. Probably the easiest way we find ourselves parenting is oftentimes we end up in the boss mode. 
And if you know this about a boss, what is a boss's primary job? A boss's primary job is to give instruction and correction. We're here to tell our employees what they're supposed to do, and when they don't do it, we bring correction. Now, if you are operating in the boss mode as a parent, you probably find the most interaction you have with your kids is when you're correcting them or you're instructing them, when you're telling them what to do, go make your bed, go do this thing, or you're correcting them because they haven't done it. Now, you have to know there's absolutely a place for authority in the house. And as parents, it's your role to stand in authority. But you have to remember that you are not a CEO running a business. You're a parent leading a family, and those are not the same thing. So if you find yourself on the boss side, you might want to go the other direction, but we've tended in culture, especially modern culture, we've gone to the other extreme, and some of you are in friend mode. Now, here's how you know you're a friend. Your kids don't call you mom and dad. They call you by your first name. Oh, snap. And we feel like, man, we just want our kids to have fun and everything to be a good time and for them to always have what we didn't have and for them to go where we couldn't go. And I want you to know this. While we love to provide for our kids and we want a relationship with our kids, your job is not to be a provider. Your job is to be a parent. And those are not the same thing. Because and here's a re there's a reason I know this is because right now, this generation, this generation, Generation Alpha, which is the youngest generation alive on planet Earth, Generation Alpha is the most... Uh, financially endowed, materially endowed generation ever to live. They have more stuff, they go on more vacations, they have more money, they have me more resources than any other generation, but they're struggling more academically, more socially, more emotionally, which means while we are trying to make our children as friends rich in experience and rich in stuff, they're poor in instruction and they're poor in correction. So the challenge is, if you're on the boss side, you need to come this way. If you're on the friend side, you need to come this way. And here's why, if you're taking notes, if you're their boss, you don't have relational equity. If only time you talk to them is when you're correcting them or instructing them, you'll find that you don't have the relationship you need when, when life really matters. And on the flip side, if you're their friend, you don't have relational authority, which means there, while we want to have relationships with our kids, and this is a secret, this is how you know, this is how you know you do really well in life is when they get older, they still wanna be your friend. But you gotta find that balance where you're their friend, where you're relational, but at the same time, you're willing to say, hey, if Jesus, the Son of God, could submit himself to his heavenly Father, then your children should be able to submit themselves to the authority in the house. Find that balance and you will succeed. Now, probably what you're gonna find is if you're a single parent, you have to figure that out on your own. And if you're in a two-parent home, you are a two-parent home or you have a two-parent home, the challenge is oftentimes what we find is somebody's the boss and somebody's the friend. And generally, and I know this, generally, guys, I, in my house, I was kind of the boss and my wife was the friend. I was truth and my wife was grace. And I want you to know, and I recognize everything I'm talking about will help you, but I did not always do this well. I have three grown kids. I now have a grandchild. And uh, so I'm on the, on the backside of parenting, and we've seen lots of success, but lots of struggles, and we've oftentimes missed the mark. And I want you to know that if you are in the model of one of you is the authority and one of you is the friend, one of you is the boss and one of you is the friend, that is the most toxic environment you can raise your kid in because your kids are smarter than you give them credit for, and they will play parents against each other, and they will get the friend to go against the authoritarian, and they'll compromise conviction, and they will compromise instruction. Get together as parents and lead your children well. So... Go ahead, Thank, let him get, just pause break. Hey Amen, it's like, Lord, help me do that. <laughs> so, so what do we need? We're giving them lots of stuff that isn't really helping them. What do we need? I'm convinced that our kids, they need two things if we're gonna build relationally. They need time with us, right? They need attention and they need affection. Everybody, those two things, what do they need? They need attention and affection. They need some time with you. And I have found that if you will spend quantity time, that quality moments naturally happen. But if you're like Eli and you're a busy CEO, or you're traveling, you're an over-the-road trucker, you're a traveling nurse, you may not have a lot of quantity time, which means you need to make sure you're giving your kids quality time. As a busy pastor, I've been busy for, since I've been in ministry, sometimes unnecessarily so, but every time I came home, especially all three of my kids, I would find myself going into the bedroom of my daughters and laying on the bed just talking about their day which have set them up to come into my office now and have good conversations with me as adults. I would oftentimes come home and the very first thing I would do is kiss my wife and I would take my son out back and I would spend 15 or 20 minutes throwing the baseball, throwing the football, just talking about his day. What I wanted my son to know is work's important, ministry's important, but family's important and you're important. And so if you have found yourself that your life is so busy 
that you don't feel like you got a lot, of, a lot of time to spend, oftentimes the default thing is just to buy our kids stuff. And I want you to hear this, that presence is more important than presence. Your presence in their life is more important than the stuff you buy them. In fact, I think what you will find is the more they have of you, the less they'll require of your stuff. And so we have to find a way, which again, I know that's difficult in a busy life, but make sure you're spending time loving your kid, challenging him and talking to him. And there's one way that you can do this. Um, if you involve yourself in conversation, you know this, that sometimes kids don't do a great job with conversation. And oftentimes as parents, we've, if we ask a yes or no question, that's what you'll get. If anything, you'll get a, uh, or you'll get a yes or no. So when I was a parent with my young kids, when I pick them up from school and I got this from James Dobson, anybody remember James Dobson? He taught me this and I, it was a takeaway that worked mostly well, not all the time. But I'd pick my kids up from school, they get in the car and I'd ask them this question. I wouldn't say, did you have a good day? Because they would say yes or no or nothing. <laughs> hey, tell me something that made you mad, sad, or glad. And they would have to dig through the day. The second question I learned to ask my, my kids, especially when they were young, is, hey, tell me more about that. How did that make you feel? How, how did you deal with that when that happened in the locker room? How did that make you feel when your teacher said that? And I found my kids opening up in conversations that really didn't seem to matter in the moment, but I was playing the long game for them to engage and involve relationally as adults. That is the long game. And so you need to make sure, and I need to make sure that I'm making time for my kid because they matter. And not just attention, we need to give them Affection, everybody say affection. Now, how many people here at the Carmel campus, my show hands at all the campuses, you're not naturally affectionate? Like you don't really like hugs or nobody. Y'all won't even raise your hand like I refuse to be acknowledged. <laughs> we, you're out here, we know you. Listen, you gotta break past that boundary and here's the best thing I can tell you about your kids is they need your affection, which means they're gonna push back against it, they're gonna resist it, they're gonna make you think they don't, ooh, don't touch me, don't do, I'm too old for that. You're embarrassing me in front of my friends. I'm telling you, lather it up. I still, my son is 20 years old. I don't care if you think I'm weird. When my kids come over every single time, I grab my daughters by the side, I pull them in, I grab my son and I pull him in hard for at least 10 seconds. I tell him I love him. And I'm not ashamed to still at times kiss my son 20 years old on the cheek because he is valuable to me and he is from his first day to his last. He needs affection like all of the rest of us. Come on, somebody. And so I, I've, I don't know about you, but I've, I've, never, I've never heard someone say, my parents told me they love me too much. They hug me too much. Now I've heard and you've heard, and maybe you've experienced, and maybe you've lived. Dad never told me he loved me. Mom never, I've never heard mom say she was proud of me. Never hugged, never kissed, never felt like I mattered. And so you might minimize those, but those building relational moments are the things that'll maximize us directing our kids onto the right path and giving us the equity that when we need to, to direct them when they get off of it. And so we need to make sure, again, we're giving them that attention. We're giving them that affection. And I would say this, that um, if you're gonna do it, excess is best. Everybody say that, excess is best. You can't have too much. Catch them doing something right. Tell them, girl, you're beautiful. Son, you're so good. My son, he looked just like me when he said, I'll drive down the road and I look in the mirror. I said, oh, son, your future's bright. <laughs> but I brag, catch them doing something right and celebrate them, brag on them. Make sure you're doing that. But excess is best. You need to give them excess time. You need to give them excess words. You need to give them excess touch. Words, again, just lather it on, find them. And here's what I have found, and I don't know if you know this, but in the most depressed generation ever, in the most depressed generation ever, God put four hormones in the human brain that you need to be happy and healthy emotionally, serotonin, dopamine, endorphins, and oxytocin. When you touch people and you hold them for more than 10 seconds, the brain emits oxytocin, the connecting hormone. Your kid feels, I matter, I'm connected, I'm not alone in this world. Number two, when you speak life over them, when you love them, when you encourage them, the brain releases dopamine, the happy hormone, which I'm saying there's nothing wrong with your kid needing counseling or having counseling. But if we wanna bypass sending our kids to counselors and help them stay on the right path as parents, we have to make sure they have excess as best, time, touch, and praise. Come on, somebody. Now, 
Some of you are like, oh, pastor, I'm so good at that. I mean, I brag on my kid all the time. They're good at everything. I love on them all the time. Take notes on this. You should affirm our children. We should affirm our children regularly, but truthfully. Somebody has been lying to some kids. I mean, there's all these music shows and they get on and they're like, so what are you here to, I'm here to sing this song and my whole family's told me I can sing my whole life and they can't sing a lick. <laughs> Don't lie to your kids. They need to hear sometimes, hey baby, you're no good at singing, but let me help you find you what you're good at. <laughs> Art, I can't, I don't even really know what that is. I know you said it's a dog, but I don't see it. Let us find, I mean, it's okay. <laughs> baby, you can't play basketball. The reason I know that it's because they never put you in the game. <laughs> Stop blaming the coach and be honest. I want to celebrate, and I didn't do this last night. I want to celebrate Pastor CJ and Kristen. They have done some of the things I'm talking about extreme well. The reason I'm here today is because he wanted to be with his daughter at a basketball tournament. Pastor CJ and I have been friends for about 10 years. And I'll just tell you just a very quick story. We were in the master's program together at Trinity Bible College in North Dakota. I'll never forget one day, one night, we're in, we had to be there four times a year for a week. Middle of the week, he's like, man, it's Miles' birthday tomorrow. He's like, I think I'm gonna drive home. And I'll be honest, I think I'm a good parent. I was like, are you crazy? He got in his car and he drove, I don't know how far it is, at that time he was in Minneapolis, from Minneapolis to North Dakota. He drove, so when Miles woke up in the morning, his dad would be there. That is a great dad. So again, I, I feel the pushback that you have, but pastor, I, I, don't want, I, don't want them to, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want them to feel like they're not good. It, it's not that. Sometimes they need to feel the weight of the world because if you don't tell them the truth now, when they hear the truth later as adults, it will crush them, which takes me to number two. This is the number two thing we need to do as parents to keep our kids on the right path. Don't rescue too quickly. In the most bubble-wrapped, helmet-wearing generation ever, As parents, we are guilty of rescuing our kids too quickly. Let me give you an example. Check this out. Back in the story, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22 to 25, it says, Now Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. They're supposed to be serving God. They're hustling women. Eli said to them, I've been hearing reports from all the people about the wicked things you're doing. Why do you keep sinning? Now imagine, so these people are trying to come to church, worship God, bring their sacrifices, and instead of that happening, and you're gonna read some other things they did wrong, they're trying to get, pick up girls. They're trying to get their phone numbers. They're trying to text them. I know they didn't have texting back then. It's my story, let me tell it. <laughs> and so they go to Eli. Eli, your kids wheels off. They're out of control. They're not doing what they need to do. And I would imagine if Eli was in this generation, and maybe it happened back in his generation, because some parents are responding like this. Don't tell my kid what to do. Leave my son alone. Who are you to discipline him? Who are you to talk to her like that? Get out, you, you have no right. And what we do as parents is we rescue so quickly, we try to get our kids out of uncomfortable conversations, uncomfortable situations, uncomfortable responsibilities, because we do not want our kids to feel that way. And while you think you're rescuing, you are ruining them, because kids build a strength of maturity by carrying the weight of responsibility. You're not helping them, you're hurting them. You're not supporting your kids, you're undermining the path that they need to be on. Stop rescuing your kids. Now, if you're guilty of it, just clap so we don't know that's you. Oh, I mean, that's right, we need to quit doing that. Here, let me, here's an example, as parents, probably we've all gone through, if your kids are real young, your time's coming, there's gonna be a Sunday night, 9.38 p.m. Your son or your daughter is gonna come to your bedroom because you're getting ready to go to bed for tonight because you're old. <laughs> Mom, Dad, I got a project like three weeks ago and I forgot about it. And I got a science experiment and it's due tomorrow. Baby, don't you worry about it. And Mama runs, Dad runs to the Walmart, 10 o'clock at night, and Junior goes to bed while you stay up till three o'clock in the morning doing the project. Why? Because you don't want Junior to get F. And so he brings his little project the next day. Teacher knows he didn't do that. He ain't near that talented. They know you did it. You're like, I didn't want him to get an F. Well, I want you to know something. You got the A. He got the F. And if you'll allow him to get the F instead of earning and living under your A, it will go far further in his development or her development and understanding the weight of responsibility in the world. Stop rescuing them. Well-intentioned parents can still 
create poorly positioned children. You're not setting your kids up for success. You're setting them up for safe spaces. Our generation, they, they can't handle it. Now, again, am I, am I saying just open your kids up to open your kids up to anybody? Open your kids up to abuse from anybody? I'm not. But I'm saying there's, there's people in the lives of your children beyond you that are in places of authority that have something to, to say to your kids that will help them, and you need to allow them to do it. In fact, I want you to hear this word. Everybody say excess. That's what we said earlier, excess time, talent. I want you to say this word, access. The biggest difference between previous generations and current generations are access. In my generation, my generation, adults had access to us in a way this generation does not, and this generation has access to things my generation did not, and that has to flip. My generation, we didn't have access to pornography. I'm not saying it was impossible to get. We didn't have access. If you were bullied at school, you could clock out and go home. Now your children are carrying mobile devices and they have access to all kinds of garbage and smut and bullying. And as parents, you need to close that access. But we've closed access. In my generation, if I got in trouble at school, I went home and got in trouble. And I know you're saying, but you're old. I know. But now our parents or our kids get disciplined in school, and instead of supporting the teacher, we support our kids, and we go up and we yell at our, at our teachers. Teachers are leaving the profession. Teachers we need to raise this generation. If you're a teacher, we celebrate you. As an administrator, we celebrate you. We need you. Support your teachers. I'm not saying they're always right. Listen, you put your kid underneath that coach to help them be better at the game. Being better at the game isn't just getting instruction, but sometimes it's, in, it's, it's correction. You need those umpires out there to tell your kid it was a strike, to tell them they're out. Stop rescuing. They need to feel the weight of disappointment and the weight of hurt because they will feel it as adults. And if they don't learn how to manage it now, they will break under the pressure of when it, ha- when it comes as an adult. So how do we let them feel the pressure besides not rescuing? Kids need two things. Kids need rules and responsibilities. What do kids need? Rules and responsibilities. It's the very first thing, watch this, the very first thing God gave his kids is the same thing you need to give your kids. Check this out. Genesis chapter two, verse 15 and verse 16. Read this with me, every voice. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to, and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So notice, God ultimately gave Adam and Eve five things. The very first two things God gave his kids, rules and responsibilities. This is my garden, but I'm letting you live here. And it's your job to tend and keep it. My son tells me it's his room. It ain't his room. That's my room. I pay the rent in that room. I'm letting you live there, tend it and keep it. This is our yard. I'm not the only one that lives in it. You help tend it and keep it. Your kids need responsibility. They need to feel the weight of something on them that they have to carry in this world. They need to have some responsibilities. And the second thing I want you to notice that God gives them is, is rules. You can, these, all these trees, you can eat of all of them except that one. There's a rule. That tree is off limits. And if you're going to help your kids and stop rescuing them and allow them to feel some of the weight that will help them to develop, you need to give them rules and responsibilities. Now, those rules, just real quick, I think we tend to give a lot of rules Don't touch your kid, don't kick, don't scream, don't run, do your homework, make your bed, brush your teeth. You can give a lot of rules. I have found that it's better to give less clear rules than lots of vague rules. God gave Adam and Eve one rule. And responsibilities, I think, should be age appropriate. Like, don't make your kid your house cleaner. I did that. When I was a kid, back in the day, we only had like three channels on TV. You have to have gray to talk about back in the day. Back in the day, Mike, our job was dad's like, hey, go fix the antennas, and then you would get it just right. Is anybody old enough to know what I'm talking about? And then you'd have to stand there so he could watch TV. (laughs) I felt abused. (laughs) Now, sometimes, I'll be honest, as a parent, now we have remotes, but the remote was all the way across the room. Zach, come in here. (laughs) Hand me that remote. (laughs) Now, that's taking advantage. Responsibilities should be should be real responsibilities that they can engage that are age appropriate, that are life stage appropriate, and rules should be clear and should be limited. But if you will give them those, it will help them to start feeling some of the weight that they need to feel. Now, the question is, what do you do when they don't do when you expect them to do? 
How do you respond as a parent when they don't embrace the rules or embrace the responsibility or follow the rules? Number three, you need to discipline consistently. Everybody say that with me, discipline consistently. Listen as the story continues. Eli goes to his sons, he says, you must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. But Eli's son wouldn't listen to their father, for the Lord was already planning to put them to death. A prophet comes to Eli and says this, I have warned him that judgment is coming upon his family forever because his sons are blaspheming God, read this with me, and he hasn't disciplined them. Now, it sounds like he did. Remember, he went to him and said, stop. But then later, God's prophet comes and says, you didn't discipline him. What Eli was doing was he was confronting without expectation. He was confronting without discipline. And I have found oftentimes, myself as a parent, that I confronted my kids, but I didn't really have discipline backing it up. And our kids, if they're gonna thrive, they have to learn that there is an appropriate response to the rebellion. We shouldn't, we shouldn't discipline our kids when they have a bad day. We shouldn't discipline our kids when they make a mistake or fall short. You shouldn't discipline your kid when they knock their milk over or their tea over or Coke over at the table. Discipline is reserved for rebellion. When they have clear responsibilities and they have clear rules and they violate those, that's rebellion. Discipline is intended to squash the rebellion, to help them to stop being scoundrels. And so in order to have discipline, like what's discipline look like? Two things. We need clear expectations and clear consequences. Everybody say that, clear expectations and clear consequences. Let me ask you a question. What are the rules and responsibilities in your house for your kids? If you don't know, I promise you they don't know. And it's unfair for you to discipline your kid for a rule they was not clear was theirs. And even more so, I would say it's unfair for you to give them a discipline that they didn't anticipate coming. So we have to find this way of giving clear expectations. Here's what I want you to do. Here are your, again, here are your rules. Here are your responsibilities. Here's what I've asked you to do. Here's your role in the home. Here's the things you're, you're called to do. And when they don't do them, we have to discipline consistently. And as parents, we stink at this. One day we discipline and one day we don't. We tell them, and oftentimes when you have two parents in the home, you'll find this interaction happen. A junior does what he shouldn't do. And so dad says, hey, I'm taking your PlayStation away for three days. Day one, he's losing his mind. He goes to his mom, mom, I'm bored. I don't have nothing to do. Well, go play your PlayStation. I can't, dad grounded me for three days. Listen, I'll talk to him, just go play PlayStation. Oh, I think some of you did that one. Because we don't wanna feel the pressure, so we pull it off of them and we create tension between the parents. And so we have, to, we have to give some clear expectations. This is what we want from you. And we have to give some clear consequences. When I was a kid, the consequences sounded like this. Oh, some of you know that sound. I know some of you, and if you don't know that sound, that's the sound of a belt coming out. If you're not for corporal punishment or capital punishment, that's okay. Uh, but let me ask you this, how's counting working for you? One, two, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm gonna get up three. If I get to five, you're in so, four, five. I'm gonna give you to 10 out of the mercy of art, seven, eight, nine. You know what you're teaching your kids? How to count. You're not teaching them how to bear responsibility. You're teaching them that they can continue to push the boundary. And when they push the boundary at the apartment complex they're living, the relationships they get into, the job they have, they will crush, crash underneath the weight of responsibility that you rescued them from. You have to discipline consistently. Now, now hear this. I think it's really less about, less about the responsibilities and less about the rules. There's some nuance there. Whatever you decide, the best thing you can do is just be swift and be consistent. Be swift and be consistent. So we all need discipline. Our kids need it most of all. So the last thing I wanna give you, uh, let me say this, kids need to have responsibility and they need to take responsibility. So when you give them responsibility, you need to make sure it stays on them and they take responsibility that belongs to them. The fourth thing I wanna give you is this right here, and we'll start wrapping this up, is live righteously. Everybody say live righteously. If you are one of the campuses or you're here and you're not a Christ follower, you just wandered in here, you're kicking the tires on faith, we are glad you're here. And all three of the first four that I've talked about apply to you, but if you're here and you're a Christ follower, number four is probably the most important thing that you can hear, is if we're gonna get our kids on the right path, we have to walk the right path. What is the path? Well, Jesus told us what the path is. He's the path. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse six, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. 
There was a study done about four years ago, massive study that was released four years ago, and it was on Gen Z. In Gen Z, there were seven markers that marked them as Gen Z. The number one marker of what's marked them as a generation is they've said this, that my parents confess values that they don't live. I'm confused morally because my parents say one thing and do another. Hear me. Your actions are speaking so loudly, your kids don't hear what you say. You teach what you know and you reproduce who you are, which means if you're gonna set a standard of faith in your household and you think Jesus is important to life and he's the path that you want your kids to walk on, they have to see you consistently walking the path if they're ever gonna walk on it themselves. Set the standard. Set the standard. That means for us, sometimes we're gonna struggle with it, but the path can be because of us or in spite of us. When I say the difference between this in spite of us or because of us, here's what I mean is you can kill it as parents. In fact, you can be a perfect parent and you can create a perfect home for your kid and them still not end up on the path. And some of you, that's a story. And that's okay because God was a perfect, he was a perfect father and paradise, right? Eden was a perfect place to raise kids and Adam and Eve still rebelled. What you want is if kids aren't gonna serve the God you serve, let it be in spite of you because you, you just don't want it to be because of you. If the only time church is important to you is when it's convenient, see, I get to go home after this, so I get to lay it down. If the only time church is important to you is when there's not a ball tournament, no dance club, no piano recitals, the weather's not perfect, if it rains too much, people don't come, if it's too cold, people don't come. Only time you go to church when it's convenient, your kids won't even go even when it's convenient. Let your kids catch you living for Jesus. Catch them doing right and let them catch you doing right. I've intentionally done this, thank you. Again, I, when I keep saying me, believe me, I have failed plenty. If my kids were here, they would tell another side of the story. But I think they would tell you that this, this, these are things that we've done. Is I do my devotions late at night. I'm a night person. My wife goes to bed early. I go to bed early, but like two, three, four in the morning. I just not a, I don't sleep a lot. But here's what I do. I've done it for years. Is when I'm finished reading my Bible, wherever I read it, I intentionally leave it out with my devotional open. So when my parents wake up, in, my, I'm sorry, my kids wake up in the morning, hey, dad read his word last night. You say, wasn't that self right you're showing up? Yep, yep. That's not the most, I want my kids to know, dad spent time with God last night. Dad got in God's word. The Bible's important to my family. I want my kids to see that. I want them to know that. I want them to catch me praying, not just at dinner time and meals. Lord, bless this food we thank you for. Bless our bodies. Thank you for the time together. In Jesus' name, amen. That's important. Bless your food. That's great. I want my kids to hear me from time to time. Lord, I need grace today. I want them to hear me praying in my office. I, not radical, pray in tongues, don't, pray whatever. I'm not saying always be out loud, but I want my kids to catch me praying, not just at dinner time. My kids have learned generosity because they've learned it from watching us. One of the things we've benefited from, not a lot, but there's been time to times we've benefited from a Pentecostal handshake. Anybody know what a Pentecostal handshake is? Let me tell you what, a, I don't know, maybe all churches do it, but it's when someone puts money in their hand and then shakes your hand, you're like, there's something in there. And every now and then, it doesn't happen a lot, but someone will come up to a pastor like me and say, Pastor, we just want you to know we love you. And it's, money. <laughs> anytime someone's given us money, I've been in ministry for over 30 years, anytime, still today, my kids are grown. Anytime someone gives us money that comes in the church, if we get a Christmas bonus, we give some to our kids. Because I want my kids to know, you've had to suffer because of the sacrifice I made. I want you to get the benefits I've got. And I've demonstrated generosity to my kids, and my kids are consistently generous. My son got a job. He's 20 years old. He's been an electrician right out of high school. Every paycheck he gets, first three things, first four things that come out, he ties, he gives money to missions, he puts money in a 401 or a, 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 a IRA Roth, uh, and he puts money in a savings account. That's the first four places he puts money before he spends a dime. I'm like, oh, I did something right. <laughs> come on. So God asked him this question, why do you scorn my sacrifices? Like, where did Eli's kids learn to be this way? How did they, how did they get wheels off? How did they, they were raised in the church. They were raised as priests. How did they end up this way? So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? For you and they have become fat on the best offerings of my people, Israel. Dad, we learned it from watching you. We're living the life that we saw you live. So I want you to know that probably most of you in this room are doing better than you think you are. At our campuses, you're probably succeeding more than you think you are. Parenting is a struggle, it's a challenge, it's discouraging, it's frustrating, it'll make you angry, it'll make you sad. But if you'll direct your children on the right path, 
when they get old, they'll not depart from it. And so I just want to encourage you today, embrace the responsibility God's given you, and let's raise this next generation of champions who live in this culture, who transform the culture around them. How many of you here at all of our campus by show hands would say, I want to be a better parent. I want to do it better. How many of you heard something you feel like, I need to apply that better? We stand to your feet if you lifted a hand? I just want to pray for you before I go. I just want to ask God to give you grace and courage and strength and tenacity. Will you lift your hands with me if you're standing? Father, we love you today. God, thanks for your word. Thanks for the example of even struggling people like Eli that we can learn from. And Lord, we confess before you we've struggled. Lord, sometimes we've disciplined too harshly and sometimes we've not disciplined enough. We've given our kids what they don't need and sometimes given them, Lord, too much of what they do need. And Father, we stand before you with this incredible responsibility to raise up the kids you've blessed us with. So Father, I pray over every parent standing, over every single parent, every blended family, over every home, I pray God grace on them, wisdom on them, peace on them, joy on them, help on them from the Holy Spirit. I pray God give them guidance in the moments they need most to make decisions that'll benefit the kids they're raising. I pray, Father, help bosses to be more relational. Help friends to walk in authority. And I pray in Jesus' name that God, when when it counts, when we get down the road, when they're adults, we're gonna look back and know because it was the grace of Jesus that they're still walking on the right path. And we thank you for that confidence in Jesus' name. And everybody who agreed said amen. Amen. God bless you, Northview. Thanks for letting me be here today.